Hey, hey, it's Shay Heaster, and I'm your host and the founder of Casual Cattle Conversations, a global rancher education company that strives to bring honest thoughts and conversations from ranchers and leaders to other ranchers. Be sure to follow Cattle Convos on social media to have more in-depth conversations around the ranching business and lifestyle brought to you. If you are ready to take your operation to the next level and improve your lifestyle too, send me a message about my Rancher Mind group. Rancher Minds are monthly roundtable discussions for ranchers to learn from peers and experts and leave the call with actionable advice to make changes on their own operations. With that, let's see who our guest is today and what experience and advice they have to offer you to improve your own operation. All right, so start off. Fun question. You're on the ranch in Colorado. What animal would you be and why of all the animals that are there? Oh, golly, that is a hard question. <laughs> um, you know, we had, well, this, and this is going to sound silly probably, but um, we had a bull when I was um, in college that we had purchased from Dishmaker Herefords up in Montana, RC Mischief D48. And he was just the coolest Hereford bull. I mean, just he was he was just really he had a great attitude. He was so easy to work with. He produced great calves, and everybody kind of loved that bull. And he was sort of the embodiment of our ranch. He was kind of the feature. So I guess I guess if I could imagine myself as a as a really good bull that would. <laughs> <laughs> RC Mr. P48 would be, and that was a long time ago, but <laughs> partly because Charlie the Dishmaker was the guy that, that created him, and that I really like Charlie, so well, that there you part go. of it. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't had someone that specific yet, but that's good. So um, then, what's, just give a brief, brief background of your background in ranching. I know you've shared with me before. But. Well, so our family, um, really both sides, my mom's side had ranching family, and my dad's side was... Uh, pretty exclusively an agricultural family from the Civil War on. Um, my great-great-grandfather homesteaded in Colorado not long after the Civil War. Um, he'd been in the Union Cavalry. Um, I think it had been a, a particularly difficult um, set of experiences. He'd spent the, the entire campaign, so he was there mm -hmm. he was in the Cavalry for four plus years. Um, and so we uh, started ranching in um, not very far from a little town called Partial, which is uh, sort of in uh, uh, sort of central Colorado, and then moved to Kremlin, which was Grand County, um, and my is where my grandfather uh, grew up. Um, ultimately, then um, you know, sort of through that Depression era, there were some challenges, you know, and there were three brothers, my grandfather and, and his two brothers, and they all were able to keep things going. And then my grandfather got into the purebred Hereford business uh, and had a business partner, um, a guy who's kind of a construction magnet from Denver, uh, his last name was Schweitzer. They formed a company called Schweitzer and Field, and uh, that was sort of the the kickoff, my dad then ran the ranch, uh, really grew the commercial side of our business, um, and that's the environment I grew up in. So, um, long history of ranching in, in, a, in one of the craziest places to, to <laughs> ranch. I mean, and we always laugh, somebody's wagon must have broken down when they decided to go to Gunnison because that, that one was it's a high desert, tough country, long winters. But I spent, you know, uh, all of my early life in Gunnison, and we still own that ranch and try and figure out how to make it work. So very much a deep family history and still today. So what is your experience with transitioning generations through the ranch and even helping other ranchers with that process? Yeah, family business, uh, I got, I, I almost by default, I got interested in it when I went back right out of college, went back to work for my dad, and that's, and, and let me tell you, we did everything that you could do wrong in setting that up. Um, the conversation was something like, oh good, you're going to come back, let's go to work. 
that was pretty much the depth of planning and discussion that went into that transition. And that was not the way to do it. Um, and and um, <laughs> I, I look back on that and think maybe that was planned so that I could, you know, benefit from those mistakes to help other people. So I transitioned back in and, and, and lived the experience, which was really valuable. Um, ultimately went in the middle of the farm crisis and went back to graduate school because we just thought everybody better have a plan B. Um, and ultimately started a class called Family Ranching at Colorado State. Um, started working with some families. Um, started doing a little bit of work trying to help families make decisions, not only uh, from a from a sort of a how to bring the next generation in, but sort of prepping leadership and, and transitioning the power and decision making. Certainly, the estate planning piece of it we left up to accountants and and lawyers. But um, you know what I've observed over time, and, and I work I've worked not only with just ranch families, but also some you know ag businesses and some other small businesses helping people sort of think their way through that, putting resources in front of them. And what I've, what I've learned is that we make the assumption that because we're all family, it will just work out. And it's, I mean, that's not a horrible assumption, but it's an assumption that's on, that, that really stands on kind of two legs. And that third <laughs> leg is about four inches too short. And so you've got sort of wobbly process in that. Um, and, and I think the best thing that happened is, is that we did it so badly. Um, and, and it didn't, I mean, it ended, it ended out, it, it worked out. But it was a it was a long difficult process which we can talk about because I'm I'm not at all afraid to talk about the mistakes <laughs> we made as a family because we sure we sure loaded them up. Well, yeah, let's talk about some of those because what are some of the main pain points you see that are causing the biggest issues for that transition back? You know, I think there were I think you know three things. The, the biggest mistake we made at the very front end is is that the depth of discussion to make the to make the decision was about a centimeter deep. I mean, it was the shallowest uh, discussion, and and we didn't talk about expectations. We didn't talk about um, about responsibilities. We didn't talk about accountability. We didn't talk about um, uh, compensation. We didn't talk about authority. We didn't talk about um, how we were going to structure the business. We didn't. Uh, we didn't. I didn't have any idea what the financials were. Um, it, it, we just, you know, it was literally, look, we got a lot of work to get done, and, you know, you're strong, and, and, and hopefully you'll work out, so my dad just put me to work. And that was, that was the biggest mistake. We had our, our process and our preparation was just completely insufficient. The second mistake I think we made, and, and, and I'm... I think a lot of families make this mistake is people don't take time to kind of get their mind right for that transition. It's different than having, you know, when I was in high school and I'd go to work full time on the ranch in the summers, that was different than becoming a full time employee there, but we treated it as if it were a summer job, but that just was going to go on and on and on and on. And so I didn't have my mind right, and, and, and I don't think, to be very honest, and, and I, I respect my father greatly, but his mind wasn't right. My mom was the only one who was looking around going, this is going to be a disaster because these two <laughs> fools have not had a conversation. Nobody had prepped our crew for it, so nobody knew what to do with me. Um, I was pretty confident. Um, I had some new ideas, and I was pretty committed to trying to drive those ideas into the business and my father was pretty interested in me having to earn my way up literally have to fight my way from the bottom of the of the the the, the bottom level of the organization on the all the way up and 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 he was going to make I, I literally believe that the only preparation that went in so when he thought there was a possibility I was coming back, I think for about a year he stored up every rotten job he could think of and had nobody else do it and said, look, when he gets back, we're going to just humble him up. Ultimately, that was probably okay because it, that was, <laughs> I probably needed the humbling. 
And then the third mistake I think we made is we didn't, there was no conversation around the future of the business. And when you come into a business and you don't know whether there's the opportunity to change the mix of enterprises, a, a change in how you're going to do business and what the goals, the objectives, maybe even some major pivots that might occur. Um, there was no real planning for, okay, so what happens if, uh, you know, what happens if, 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 you know, if my father had gotten ill or had been injured, there was no conversation at all about contingency planning. So we just hadn't done any of those pieces. And those are all pieces that I really encourage people to take time to think about. A transition, you know, business transition should be a process, not a moment in time. And we treated it like a moment in time, and that was a massive mistake. <laughs> so you brought up a good point that like you came home and you had ideas and you wanted to change things. So you had the vision for the business. And I think a lot of times when the younger generation does come home, they have these. But how does that younger generation make sure that they find their place? Because everyone has their different talents. Yeah, I, I think it's a generational thing. And, and this may be something that, that is, is, is through time, right? I mean, um, even if you read in the Old Testament, I mean, fathers and sons have been knocking heads for a long time. And I think, I think daughters and dads and, and son-in-laws and, and dads and, and brother-in-laws and brothers and sisters, I, I think there's just this natural thing in, in humanity where sometimes we knock heads because we're imperfect. Um, but as I think about, you know, the, the, the process, one of the things that, that I wish I would have done, I wish I would have slowed myself down early and said, okay, let's figure out why they do what they do here. Yeah, so we would wean calves within probably, I mean, within seven days plus or minus off of, of uh, Thanksgiving for as long as I can remember, right? We, 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 everything was sort of staged out in timing. And we were, pretty, we were a pretty traditional outfit. Um, and so I, I, and I came in and I was, I was challenging everything, right? And, mm -hmm. and sometimes not challenging it with the kind of um, humility and the kind of generosity and gentleness of spirit that was really required to, to really move um, change forward, right? I, mm -hmm. I, there's, a, uh, there's a great book, um, that I, I've been sort of studying, uh, a guy by the name of Bob Goff wrote a book called uh, Love Does. And one thing he talks about is, is if you're gonna get into a conversation where there may be some, some conflict or some disagreement, instead of clenching your fists, you know, get your palms up or your palms down, but open your hands up. And I probably went in with, you know, I probably went in <laughs> fists, you know, clenched and, you know, ready to do some boxing to get my, fight my way in, right? Um, and looking back, that was a, that was that was problematic. The other thing my dad and I did is we competed. Um, you know, he was still pretty. He was still young enough, and 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 so we were, we was competitive. I mean, literally, we would speed up getting to a gate if we were both horseback and we had the crew with us. We'd speed up and almost race to a gate to see who could get their first opening. And and it wasn't it wasn't it was like subconscious. I mean, I look back on I'm like. I'll bet people, I'll, I'll, well, one, I'll bet the crew is going, okay, watch this. <laughs> right, but they're going, good, we'll never have to open another gate because these two fools are, are, are competitive. And then there were enough other ranches in our valley where sons had just come back. Then there was kind of this competition. I remember that one, about the first winter I was there, it became a competition amongst ranches to see who could get cattle fed first in the morning. And it got to the point where we were still load, we'd load hay um, at, and we were feeding small bales in those days, and we would load hay um, at maybe 4.30, 5 o'clock in the evening, um, and, and so we'd be ready first thing, I mean, at first light, man, we'd be ready to start feeding. And then it got to the point where we were trying to stage the trucks out closer to the feed grounds, and, and it just got sillier and sillier, and, and to the point where literally the cattle would stand in the willows, and they'd, they'd kind of look at like, uh, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> and finally, I think the moms all got together and put an end to the madness because we were, you know, I mean, we were trying to feed cows at 
you know, 4.30 and 4.45 in the morning, just ridiculous. But it, I think that spirit of competition can be really good, but when you let it get out of hand, and, we, and what we were doing was we were competing instead of collaborating, and that was a mistake. Right, so kind of going back to the first part where you said you just, the conversation was a centimeter deep and it was you were coming home to work. How, as the younger generation, do you bring up, or even the older generation, bring up that topic so it's not just a centimeter deep? So it's not just, well, I guess I'm graduating, I don't want to get another job, I'll just come home. So Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's a two-way conversation, and I think it, I think it needs to happen in... Um, sort of a staged approach. Now, one thing I will say, and I'm, I'll throw this out, and, and I know I'm, I'm not a big fan of one-size-fits-all strategies, but in working with farm and ranch families and agribusiness families, and even some other kind of small family businesses in other categories, one thing I would say is, is that if I could wave a magic wand, every young person coming back to a family business would have to spend at least two or three years working for somebody else. The Australians are very good at this. They tend to, to trade kids, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and I got a little bit of that because I did a lot of work for Strang Herefords um, and, and I got to work for, for Bart and Mary Strang and Meeker, um, especially with their show cattle and, and just, you know, with, we, we owned some cattle together in the purebred business and I loved that. I'm, and, and I respected Bart and Mary both, and they were very good at mentoring me, and I, I'm, I'm so mm -hmm. thankful for that because they were able to, to probably engage with me and get me to, to, to soften up. And you know, sort of like you know, a good horse, mm -hmm. if you, you, you've got to soften that horse's mouth up. But the first thing you have to do to soften up a horse's mouth if you're a, you know, a good cowboy is you've got to soften yourself. And I think their job was to soften me up. Um, and so I, I think everybody ought to have that, that perspective, right? Working for somebody else, seeing a different way, understanding that there are more than, there's more than one way to get to the top of that hill, um, that there's more than one path on the map, right, to get to a destination. So you know, that, I think that's the key thing. If, if you can get that done, that's pretty powerful. But then you've got to step back and say, okay, like if, if the goal is, is you're going to come back first thing out of high school or college or out of community college or whatever the situation is, and it doesn't necessarily have to be right out of education. It might even be somebody that's been out in the corporate world for uh, a decade and wants to come back home to the farm or ranch. You know, don't just, again, don't make it like you were... You were working for Corporation A on, on Friday at, at, at 5, and you, you walked away from that job. You moved on Saturday and Sunday and Monday morning. You're at work at the, at the ranch with no conversation. That's not going to end well. It's going to be problematic. So I think having a process, and, and literally how do you start the, the conversation? There are two things that have to happen. One, both parties, both generations have to come into the conversation acknowledging this fact. One, the newest, the, the upcoming rising generation, you have to come into the conversation with this attitude. Mom and dad do not owe me a job. That's number one. The senior generation, though, also has to come to the table and say, I'm not going to make you an indentured servant. Right? Mm -hmm. And both parties have to come to grips with that. Um, and so you have to sort of say, is, is, is there an opportunity here? As the senior generation, am I willing to give up over time or am I willing to train and teach the next generation to take on responsibilities? Am I willing to rethink the business a little bit and to be open to new ideas and to, to figure out ways to test those ideas without breaking the company? So that's critical, that, that, that attitude. And then secondly, how do you get the conversation going? It really is, is this simple, and, and, and men, we probably aren't that good at it. And I, what I have now is, you know, 40 plus years of experience to think about where we were at when I was 22 years old. Um, but what I wish we would have done is say, look, I care enough about the relationship I have with you and this is a two-way street, both me to my dad and my dad back to me, that we're going to go into this 
professionally, and we're going to do our very best to keep the father-son relationship as one relationship and the, and the business relationship as another, and we're going to determine what that looks like. We were really, we were not good at that early. Later on, we got better at it. Um, but early on, oh, <laughs> we were a mess. Um, so, you know, that's, I, I, think, I think that's the key, right, is to have that conversation. I care enough about you, I, and I value my relationship as either your father or your son, or your father, your daughter, your mother, your daughter, your mother, your son, whatever the relationships mm -hmm. are, right, and say, look, I care enough so much about that. Before I let the business ruin that relationship, I want to have a long and detailed conversation. And I want to also come into it recognizing there's going to have to be flexibility and that maybe everything ought to be started with, okay, let's do a six-month trial run. Let's see where we're at. Into six months, let's sit down and talk about it. And let's get things on the table. And yet, you know, if you grew up in a family store like I did where, you know, somebody asks you how many cows you have, well, that's, you don't ever tell them that. If, they, if you take that, that philosophy too far, then you're not talking to each other inside the organization. That's also a problem. I like what you said about, you know, sit to have those meeting points after so many months to evaluate and go through it because some, like even as family when you get to that point where you want to maybe even avoid conflict but then it becomes a greater problem because it doesn't get talked about and then it can blow up into a huge problem once it does get brought yep. up. So, so many operations would be considered diversified operations and the younger generation coming in wants ownership of something so bad because they don't want to be the servant. How can they work and find their place or maybe their niche on an operation because with everyone's different talents it might not be the farming it might not be the cattle it might be something completely different how can we explore those areas that's a really good question and my approach to that when i when i especially when i work with families where there are lots of offspring um i'll say to them look you know each each of you that plan coming back in you need to be able to write a plan, if you will, develop a set of outcomes, objectives, goals, vision, about how you're gonna actually add value to that business, right? How are you going to add value to the business? And, and, and that may mean um, taking a hard look at the financials and saying, look, I'm gonna have to have a side gig so that the, the farm and ranch can't afford me right now. So I'm gonna to have to have something on the side that gets me enough income that I can afford to be at least, you know, two thirds, three quarter time in this business for starters. And if you start with that approach, what value am I going to bring? How, because if we were going to work for somebody else, right, we'd be answering that question, right? right? right. The, like that's, yeah. I mean, it's so funny. We think, well, because we're family, we just don't have to ask those hard questions. No, it's even more important to ask those really hard professional questions to family members. And, 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 and you've also got a, the challenge, I think, for parents is this fair and equal thing really is problematic because a lot of times we confuse those two terms. Equal is not the goal. Equal is not the goal. If equal is the goal, you are going to sell the business. If equal is the goal, I just want to say this over and over again, if equal is the goal, you are on a path to selling the business. Now, it may not be immediately. It might take a generation and a half. It might take two generations. But if every discussion is equal, 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 then that business is going to be, it, it's just setting itself up for sale. Okay, and, and, and for some families, that's, that is the most important thing, and, and, and I'm not going to pass judgment on that. You know, when I was 22, 23, 24 years old, I probably thought I was capable and ready to step in and start running that company, right? Um, it would have been, that, thank goodness that didn't happen because we, we would have cratered the business. I was not ready. Um, today, you know, I think I'm, I'm ready to do that kind of thing. So you've got you've to sort of sort it out. And, and I think about my own 
kids. You know, which one has the right demeanor, the right skill set, uh, the right set of emotional and technical intelligence mm -hmm. to actually run the company someday. And um, they are not equal in all of their talents, right? They're all talented, but which is the one with the right mix? And that's a hard that's a hard thing for a parent to do, right? Because we 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 see our children, we say, well, we love them all, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we love them equally. Yes, right? That's that's part of parenthood. So separating that parental role out is really, really critical. And it takes lots of conversation, a lot of discipline, and the capacity to forgive each other a lot because it's easy to slip back into the parent-child relationship. Um, you know, even as even as an adult male, right? I would if if something sort of would go south, I would have to make sure that I didn't in my head say, "Well, you know, my I don't know why my dad let me do that, right?" As if it were his fault. No, I mean, hey, it's on, it was on me. And learning to take accept that accountability is a really huge piece of being ready to go back to business. That's all awesome. So, do you recommend like? When these meetings happen, like have them with the banker there, have them with some outside source there, or is it okay if it's just the father son, father daughter, just mm -hmm. those entities? Yeah, you know, I think there are I think there are a whole series of conversations and I think the conversations take place in a lot of different ways. One of the things that, that, that I would encourage people if they have the luxury of still having kids who are younger, um, let's just say sophomores, juniors in high school or younger, start having informal conversations with those kids and testing things by, you know, when, 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 you, when you're faced with a situation, saying to that kid, how would you solve this? Right? Finding a manageable problem and handing it over to your 14-year-old twins, right? And see what they do with it. You know, don't hand them, don't hand them the, the, the keys to the bank, but hand them over a problem that if they get it right, it's awesome, they learned a lot. Mm -hmm. But if they get it wrong, they got it wrong. It, do, it doesn't, I mean, we, we can resolve whatever mis mm -hmm. additional mistake they make, but create those informal conversations and those sort of testing grounds but do it from a place of coaching, not from a place of judgment. And, and that's hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and then, you know, do you bring in outsiders? So I think there's these, like, if you can have these informal conversations, it's really helpful because then you develop trust. And if you don't have trust, if there's not trust, no amount of facilitation, no amount of resourcing, no amount of books, no, no, no amount of profit, is going to hold that thing together. If there's not trust, ultimately the, the absence of trust will lead to, you know, it's again, it's like too much focus on equal, you're going to sell the business. No trust, you're eventually going to sell the business or it's going to fall apart. Um, and then each family's got its own personality. Right, and it also has its own set of generational um, dynamics. You know, the three generation family, where there's grandparents, maybe parents, and an aunt and uncle, and some cousins, plus some siblings, and whew, right now we got we have a lot more players. And I think the more players you have, the more important it becomes to develop a really thoughtful process that that allows people to have a seat at the table appropriately right I mean I'm not sure a 14 year old needs to fully have a vote um, you know because you, you're not seasoned yet your brain isn't fully formed yet you know that's but but you maybe ought to at least be at the table listening um, and I think you figure that out and but I I think the mistake a lot of family businesses make is they don't bring outside folks in and there's a value in that. Um, and especially if they bring, you know, that sort of humble and, and servant leadership approach, they can just provide so much value. And, and frankly, you know, we had, um, we had a, 
our, our family had the same banker for a long time, the same attorney for a long time, and they knew all of us well enough to, to kind of coach us at times uh, when we really needed it. You've talked a lot about coaching and love and trust and emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that? Would you say emotional intelligence is doing pretty good in, some, in the people you work with or would you say it's a major area that a lot of ranchers need to work with? That's a great question and I, and I want to be I want to be thoughtful and, and I, I want to you know as, as I think about the work I've done and, and, and my friends and neighbors and colleagues in this business, especially for men in this business, and especially men of my generation and older, we have that sort of independent, self-reliant, um, don't say too much, let your actions speak louder than your words, be tough, don't quit, cowboy up, all those things which I value, by the way. Mm -hmm. I value all of those things. But we probably have valued them at such a high level that we aren't authentic with the people in closest relationship to us, right? I have a relationship with our ranch manager where we have both had tears in our eyes trying to solve a problem, not because we were mad at each other, but because we were, and, 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 and he is, he is one tough dude. Now, I like to think of myself as pretty tough, but he is one tough dude. And because we've established trust over so many years, we can share that, right? It's more like brothers um, uh, than than really an, uh, an employee owner kind of, of thing. I think you have to. I think you have to cultivate that in yourself. And 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 I'm not talking about being weak. And I'm not talking about being, um, you know, um, just sort of, you know, having no spine or core or conviction. But the reality is, is that, you know. Business is filled with lots of hard conversations, and if you can have those hard conversations palms up, and with an open heart, doesn't mean that you're not going to have conflict, right? Productive mm -hmm. conflict is a powerful thing, but if you can get if you can get into those spaces and work through problems without well focusing on the problem and not on the person, that's a great skill, and that was one of the things that I have, I, I will tell you, my whole life in a family business I've had to work on that is focus on the problem not the person just because all of a sudden something triggers a memory of your brother that, that flashes back to when you were seven and you're still <laughs> trying to get even you know you've got to have enough self-awareness to say okay where's that tension coming from is it really coming from the problem or is it coming from some unresolved issue in my past mm -hmm. right and and learning to let go of those unresolved things. Again, again, it's back to that fair thing, right? And saying, okay, when I say I forgive you, I forgive you, and I'm gonna move on. And when I move on, I'm really serious. I'm not bringing, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm moving on and secretly hoarding, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the frustration or the animosity, because I want to bring it with me just in case I need it. Just to and, it out everywhere. Yeah, and, and, and I, I don't think we laugh at ourselves enough either because you know, if you don't have a sense of humor, family business is really hard because <laughs> we're because it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's an organization where you bring the two biggest challenges, the things we're most tied to, which is our identity, right? And our identity is tied to our family, to and, and tied to what we what we do professionally, especially for men. And if we don't. If we can't talk through both those venues, uh, you know, we, we sometimes create carnage in our wake. Well, absolutely, and I mean, that's something that, I mean, we've talked about before, that's important in all business aspects, too, F um, focusing on the problem and not necessarily the people and that emotional intelligence. But with that, is there anything else you want to add to the conversation today before we wrap up? Yeah, two quick things. I just encourage people. One, you know, is is, is have do some strategy thinking, like do some visioning together. Do it off ranch. 
Um, I think it, I think you do better when you do that. And if you've got a generation coming back that has, you know, I, I don't like this term, the trailing spouse. I, I, I would prefer, you know, if you've got a generation coming back and there are that gen, that generation has a significant other, a husband or a wife, or a or a, a, a potential husband or wife, and 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 maybe even if they've been off ranch for a while, coming back and they've got children, have the conversation about okay, how do we create the right roles, the right opportunities for everybody in the game? And one of the mistakes that's made is is that the older generations, my generation older, sometimes have a tendency to say, well, we get very gender specific. The women are going to be moms, and they're going to, they're gonna, and they may come sort cattle, but they're going to cook, and they're going to take care of the kids, and they're going to right. And and if I have that expectation as the dad of my daughter-in-laws, given their talent, I'm not very smart, right? So how do I create opportunity, potentially in the business, potentially in the community, to bring those daughter-in-laws and son-in-laws in who may not be ranked specific? but who can add massive value to our community. And by making a little investment in their business, I've also diversified the risk for the family. So I, I think it's, it's being aware of, of, of a world bigger than just the ranch. And I think as the world changes and as we face new challenges and opportunities, I think it's really important to step back about every five or 10 years and say, okay, if we weren't ranching, what else could we do? Not that you're ever going to follow through with it, right? but it's awfully nice to have that plan sitting in the wings because that may in fact be the mountain that, that you want your next generation to climb. Well, awesome. Thank you very much for sharing all your insight today. Yeah, my pleasure. Lots of fun. And that's a wrap on that one. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the episode. And if you have any further questions around the topic, take care and have a great day.